Hi, in this video we're going to talk more about risk analysis and computing and business problems. So in a previous video I showed you some techniques so you can estimate technology and risk questions such as how likely is a server to fail or how likely are we to get hacked or how likely is a fire and so these questions come up. Now your boss is going to say I need a good answer something better than not very often or pretty likely. We need some numbers. And so we're not going to give our boss these wishy-washy answers. We need some better facts. Now fortunately, there are some statistical analysis on different things that happen in the real world. And so here is one way to look at a event in your life called a micromort. A micromort is defined as a one in a million chance of dying. So not very likely, but it's not zero. So for instance, in the United States, every day, as an average person, you face 22 micromorts per day, or that's about 8,000 per year. So every day you live, you have 22 out of a million chances of dying just from everyday activities. So here's some examples. So death from scuba diving. And the chances here are that you spend about five micromorts per dive. And then the... Uh, non-trained people have double that. It's 10 micromorts per dive. So let's look at some other examples here. So base jumping in Norway, uh, that is 430 micromorts per jump. Or if you want to climb the Matterhorn, uh, apparently that's 2,800. And if you're going up Mount Everest, you're at 37,000 micromorts. So these are pretty risky events when you consider how many numbers are associated with them. Let's take a look at some other activities. So, for instance, hang gliding. That's only 8 per micromort. Taking a pill, ecstasy, that'll get you up to 13. Being born, though, is pretty risky, 430. Giving birth is also risky for the mother, 120. And we've got ourselves other things, such as travel. Look at the list here. So if you are taking a mile per micromort measurement here, this will tell you, relative to other transportation, how risky they are. Let's look at the, the car right in the middle. So you can travel 230 miles in your car to create the risk of one micromort. So that means the more miles you travel to a micromort, the safer the travel is. So train is obviously very safe. A jet is five times safer than a car. Walking, not so safe. Biking, worse. Motorcycle, six. So that's pretty risky. So compare the car and the motorcycle. It says here that a thousand mile trip by a car will yield you 4.3 micromorts. A thousand miles by motorcycle will give you 166, which tells us that the motorcycle is 38 times more risky than driving a car. Your mom was right. It's a donor cycle. An interesting statistic says that war is, quote, safer today. So a soldier in Afghanistan would face 47 micromorts per day. And according to the statistics in World War II, flying a plane, a bomber, over, the, uh, over Germany in the Second World War would cause you 25,000 micromorts. So it is slightly safer to fly a bomber than it was to climb Mount Everest. Another interesting way to uh, look at this is through something called microlives. This is a half hour of life-changing expectancy. So you can see that on the left side, we have unhealthy things. So for example, if you eat a steak, you're going to live a half hour less, 30 minutes less on average for every steak you eat. Or if you eat an apple, that should bring your life expectancy 30 minutes longer. Or if you smoke a pack of cigarettes, you're going to lose five hours of lifetime. And so, of course, this isn't a one-to-one -one thing, but this is a statistical accuracy of how they see it over millions of people over millions of hours. So the people that work on this kind of thing all the time are insurance companies. They have to calculate premiums and life insurance somehow, and so they will know certain things, such as a 30-year-old woman with, a, with no pre-existing conditions will spend about $3,600 year, a year in medical treatments. However, the same 30-year-old, the same age, has diabetes and she smokes. She's going to spend $28,000 a year. And so these two factors 
are obviously going to be known by the insurance companies. So the question is going to be like, do you charge these people the same amount for their premiums? Or do you give a discount to the girl who's running on the treadmill? So in the previous example, we saw that the pre-existing condition is going to be so much more expensive and the healthy person is so little expensive. Now, the federal government, though, has changed the rules, of course, with Obamacare, that you cannot deny insurance to the pre-existing problems. You must take them on. So as a statistician, the people are going to ask, how much are we going to charge each customer? How are we going to spread this risk around? So the point of the video here is not just to show you interesting microboards, but it's to talk about managing your IT services. So we've got all these problems that could occur with your business, right? You've got hard drive failures, we have internet issues, we have fires, we have strikes, we have lawsuits, we have air conditioning problems. Everything can go wrong. And what can go wrong eventually will. So we want to know how likely they are to happen and what we have to spend to avoid those problems. So I'm going to give you an assignment where you actually have to come up with some estimates on how often these things happen. And so I've got a few examples here. So I googled this, how often do hard drives fail? And I came up with some actual numbers here from this website that shows that According to ProSoft Engineering, generally speaking, you can rely on your hard drive for three to five years on average. There we got it. The okay. online backup company Backblaze analyzed the failure rates of their 25,000 running hard drives. They found that 90% of hard drives survived for three years and 80% for four years. Thank you, Google. That seems to be about like what I found here. All right, so we got some actual numbers. So hard drives, they uh, look like three years and out. So that would be a good answer for your boss is to say, replace everything after three years because the risk is starting to go up. Some of the questions that I look for are a little bit more difficult, such as how often does web services fail for AWS? And they say not very often. So they're giving us a guarantee of 99.99%. I don't know, can we trust that? How reliable are communication links? So the best I could come up with was something such as, quote, T1 lines are extremely reliable. And then the downside is that DSL services are considered, quote, not a priority service. And so if I were talking to my boss, I would say, boss, let's spend the extra money if we need this thing to work all the time. Let's get a T1 line. Here are some more statistics that I found. There are hacking and failure statistics all over the internet, so Googling these will bring you some good results. Now you're watching this video because you're taking a class with me, right? Or maybe you're just watching out of interest. But anyway, here's the task that I would like you to do. So let's come up with this bakery. Uh, let's call them Osterhaven. It sounds like a good German name. And they are currently getting all of their websites and businesses services inside their own data center. And now I'm going to give you a job to do some risk analysis. Make an important decision. The decision is we are going to consider moving our servers from our own site and putting them on the cloud. So everyone seems to do the cloud, right? Does it save you money? Does it reduce your risk? Does it make your service better? Those are all questions that a business owner needs to answer before they start spending money. So what kind of risks should we consider, such as, is the risk of unauthorized access into our system greater with the cloud or less? If you put your services on AWS, someone might say, they're in a more publicly accessible location. Everyone knows that AWS is a big fat target and there are many companies there, so it's very high profile and likely to get hacked. All the other contrary could say, hey, wait a minute, our servers are already connected to the internet, so we're not exposing them to something new. And we think, we probably would say, that Amazon has better security than our little back room. So, there are points to both sides. The boss, though, is going to say, what is this probably business? We can't make decisions based on your gut feelings. Doesn't have anyone have any answers? Go get some facts. Go get me some numbers, and then we can start talking. So that's what we're trying to do, is come up with some numbers. Here's another question we would consider before we make a business move. We would say, what's the risk of disclosure of a company data of a, in case of a server breach? So someone might say for AWS that an attack on AWS is essentially an attack on the entire system. So if Amazon fails, all their customers will fail. Or someone might say, 
Really, are you serious? Our, our disclosure doesn't depend on the servers that Amazon runs, but it depends on our own code and our own databases and how we configure them. So I think that the service level is about the same, and it depends on how well we program. So the boss says, can someone tell me what the main factors are that leads to unplanned data exposure? So it sounds like some research is needed here to make the boss happy again. Here's another question you might come up with. What's the risk and what's the level of modification or the problems that could occur if data is corrupted? So someone might say, you're putting your most valuable assets in the hands of a company that is a vendor? Shouldn't we take care of the data ourselves? And someone else might say, well, we keep one tape ad in the vault. Yeah, we keep a little bit of a backup. But AWS has servers that are distributed throughout the country, maybe the whole world. And they have fault tolerance. They're not going to burn down. They're not going to flood. So I think AWS is better. And then the boss says, hey, what's the cost of a data center? And how much does it cost to fix one and to replace it? Do we pay more for Amazon and not have to worry about replacing a data center? Give me some numbers, please. And so once again, this is a research question that your boss has asked you to make. Here's another question such as denial of access attack, maybe a DDoS. So the contrarian might say, we don't want to go to AWS. They're under attack all the time. There must be thousands of people that would like to bring them down. So yes, denial of service is going to happen on us if we go to AWS. Or the person that's in favor of moving would say, hey, listen, Amazon has the ability to survive the most severe distributed attacks, the DDoS attacks. They've never had an outage. They must be well prepared, so we can trust them. So the boss says, is there extra resiliency in AWS? And do they charge us extra money? And if so, is it worth it? So tell me what the cost is for an outage and how much I should pay to avoid it. So for this assignment, I'm going to give you a spreadsheet and I'm going to ask you to come up with some estimates. So just like we did with the previous work on estimating micromorts and estimating the likelihood of death or the probability of death or the severity of an event, uh, we're going to have to do some estimation and defend your answer here. So let's do a spreadsheet that looks something like this to answer the question about whether we should move. So we have to ask, how much does a small company pay to maintain its servers in its own data center? How much do similar costs maintain on the uh, Amazon side? How much money does an, a one-day outage cost a small company? And can you justify the cost of one system over the other? So these are business questions. And these are things that you probably will have to help your boss on someday if you're working in this kind of environment. So at the end here, we will have one final deliverable. We'll have a document that will summarize our decision, and we will back it up with some numbers that we've come up with based on our research as well as estimations. So let's find out if Ulsterhaven should move their servers or keep them where they are.